Webster Tarpley, welcome. Thank you very much. Good to be here. Good Happy to, New Year. <laughs> Good to have you, Webster. Happy New Year to you. Gerald R. Ford, President of the United States from 1974 to 1976, is widely hailed as a national healer, that he woke us from our long national nightmare. Was Gerald Ford a healer? Well, I would say the real message of the Ford administration is he, he had proclaimed the Constitution works. I would say the lesson is the Constitution does not work. And when he said our long national nightmare is over, I would say, no, it was just beginning. In other words, his presidency marked a qualitative increase in the power of a force I call the invisible government. The term is not new with me. It's been kicking around since the 1950s and 1960s. What I mean by it is the idea that the government of the United States is dominated on many issues much of the time from behind the scenes by what amounts to a clique of bankers, a banker's cabal, um, mainly embracing Wall Street, the city of London, uh, the financier faction. You can call them the Anglo-American financier faction. They've been around for a good 400 years. Their crimes are, are legion. And it is this uh, invisible government to which Gerald Ford was a servant, not, not to the Constitution or anything like that. He was a devoted follower, servant, and, and errand boy, indeed, for this, uh, for this entity, this, this corrupt financier entity, which has helped to destroy the country. Uh, the living standard in the United States has declined by two-thirds since the moment he said the, uh, the long national nightmare is, is over. Now, he was, of course, a person of very limited mental capability. Lyndon B. Johnson, who had known him you know, very closely because Johnson had been in the Senate at the same time that Ford had been in the House of Representatives, said this man is so dumb that he can't walk and chew gum at the same time. He's evidently played football too long with no helmet. Uh, another good one is William Loeb, the reactionary extreme right-wing curmudgeon who ran the Manchester Union leader and, and was so important in so many primary campaigns for so long, would uh, he would coin names for people as they came into the state. And for Ford, it was Jerry the Jerk. So he's somebody of extremely modest capabilities. But the administration that he led was a, was a turning point in the increased power of this financier cabal over the United States, and this, of course, it's something that builds up to 9-11, that uh, looks back to the Kennedy assassination and a whole series of other things that we can't get into. But maybe to start from the Kennedy assassination, I would say this is the moment when, when Gerald R. Ford somehow emerges from the pack of Midwestern Republican congressmen uh, or other elected officials, Hugh Scott of Pennsylvania or Rhodes of Ohio or Dirksen of Illinois, uh, all of them more famous than him, uh, he is chosen in, in 1964 to be a member of the uh, Warren Commission to investigate the Kennedy assassination. And he, Gerald Ford now dying uh, this, uh, this past December is the last surviving member of that Warren cover-up commission, even though Senator Arlen Specter was the principal lawyer for the commission. It is he who invented the lunatic theory of the magic bullet, that one bullet can cause seven wounds and then still be found on a stretcher in relatively pristine condition at Parkland Hospital in Dallas. I would say that what Ford did on the uh, Warren commission was largely to play the role of filler, uh, of a supernumerary, right? Somebody who was going to raise his hand and approve whatever the, the more powerful members of the commission wanted. And that essentially meant two people, I would say, not so much Warren, former governor of California, former chief justice of the Supreme Court, but uh, Alan Dulles is the person who really ran this. And Alan Dulles, of course, this, these are the fascist pro-Hitler uh, Dulles brothers, John Foster Dulles, Secretary of State for Eisenhower, Alan Dulles, the head of the CIA for all those years, uh, and it's Alan Dulles who superintended a cover-up. And we, we know, of course, from, from Joan Mellon's writings that if there's a matrix or locus where the Kennedy assassination was planned and carried out, it's the CIA operations directorate, and she's shown this in, in I think, exhaustive detail in, in uh, one of her recent books. So Alan Dulles is there to steer 
the commission away from actually showing that Lee Harvey Oswald was an agent for CIA, FBI, and the U.S. Customs, uh, and into the into the fields of the the magic bullet. The other guy in that commission who's, who merits uh, mention, John J. McCloy, extremely powerful uh, member of the Eastern Establishment. Indeed, for some period of time in the fifties and forties, fifties, and maybe into the sixties, the spokesman, the person who articulated in public the views of this banker's clique, and he would take his place with people like, oh, Andrew Mellon, Colonel Stimson, later McGeorge Bundy, George Schultz, uh, James Baker, in our own time. We have a little bit of a, of a difference of opinion in the ruling elite right now. But this is, how, this is how Gerald Ford got their attention, because he was simply willing to, you know, to vote up the most absurd uh, lunatic uh, theories, the magic bullet and the, the lone assassin theory, the entire um, Kennedy assassination cover-up. So that then brings us to, a little bit beyond this, uh, Watergate, something that starts, as we know, in, in, in 1972. Uh, before we speak about Watergate, I did want to ask you, do you know specifically who chose Gerald Ford for the commission, and, and how did they know how he would operate there? No, I, I haven't really gone into the details of that. I mean, obviously, you'd have to, Earl Warren would have an, an important role in it, and uh, I think some of them were chosen in in conference with President Johnson because it was it was a commission that he created. So, uh, again, Johnson wants to get a commission to investigate the Kennedy assassination, and he chooses a man whom he's already described as so dumb that he couldn't walk and chew gum at the same time. So not too much zeal for truth. Well, Webster, we were going to move on to Watergate, and as we do, I wanted to ask you, how and why was Gerald Ford selected to be Nixon's new vice president after Spiru Agnew resigned? Could you talk a little bit uh, briefly about what happened to Agnew? Well, the general context of this is Watergate is a coup d'etat. Watergate is not what you think. Watergate is not two crusading journalists, Woodward and Bernstein, working for the lovable curmudgeon Ben Bradley of the Washington Post and fighting uh, the establishment and you know, scooping the New York Times and doing all this, this crazy stuff. Watergate is a coup d'etat. It's quite evil, as you can see from the results, uh, brought about by the same banker's clique with the help of CIA, FBI, Henry Kissinger, uh, and the rest. And, and Gerald Ford is essentially a bit player, a walk-on part, uh, in this, and it, it reminds us that you know, simply being president of the United States uh, doesn't really indicate very much that you have special power. You can you can easily be a puppet, as as indeed he was, a puppet of Kissinger. Above all, for the most most of the time he was in office. Basically, the idea was that at, at a certain point you have this move by the banking establishment to change the character of the presidency. Um, and with the why of Watergate, we can, we can go through a number of things before we get to this. One, one reason that Nixon was brought down was because Nixon had liquidated the Bretton Woods system, the only uh, monetary system the world had, and indeed the most successful monetary system in the history of the world, which uh, had been wantonly destroyed by Nixon on August 15, 1971. It's a date that I would stress. It is the turning point in all of our lives. Anybody who's lived back to that time should mark that as the time when things go from improvement and progress towards pessimism, decline of the labor movement, decline of living standards, and so forth. It's intimately bound up with the fact that the, that the monetary system was junked by Nixon and his, uh, and his advisors, Connolly, Greenspan, uh, and a bunch of others, Arthur Burns at the Federal Reserve. The Bretton Woods system had allowed the, the uh, reconstruction of the world after World War II. It was essentially the Roosevelt New Deal for the world. Uh, it's the greatest achievement of Franklin D. Roosevelt's administrations in, in a certain sense because it made possible the highest rates of economic growth the world has ever seen. Uh, the problem, of course, was that the U.S. Uh, was not exporting enough, and therefore there was no demand for dollars, so people kept coming to the U.S. to get gold from Fort Knox, and it was on August 15, 1971, the British, as usual, who come in and destroy the system by demanding several billion dollars worth of gold stocks, which would have started a, a run uh, on the dollar. So Nixon is the guy who carries this out. Um, 
I would just point out that having lived through this in pretty much in active political life, it's worth noting that every government in the world, more or less, except the Soviets, the Chinese, the, the North Vietnamese, and the, the communist world, every capitalist government in, in Europe, certainly, in uh, Japan, uh, and in North America, Canada, all of these governments fell as a result of this huge change. And the idea is, it's a small clique of financiers who want to carry this out, but the backlash that it creates is, is huge because it means that the entire economy goes on a downward path. Remember also that Nixon had decreed wage and price controls. He had decreed phase one, phase two, phase three. This created a tremendous amount of friction that led to a, a, a general desire to somehow do something against Nixon. That would be number one. Second point on Nixon would be the Vietnam War which was, of course, being prolonged by Nixon and Kissinger in a way that was excruciating for people who, who lived through it at the time. And also, of course, they were losing, right? The January 1973 uh, Paris Peace Accord, so-called, is essentially the defeat of the United States and the departure of the U.S. from that, from that region. You've also got an energy crisis going on, right? You've got this fake oil crisis of 1973-74 that Nixon does nothing to, to fight to stop it's essentially a, uh, a cabal of the uh, cartel, the oil cartel, the Seven Sisters, the Anglo-American uh, oil companies meeting at the, uh, I guess this one is the Bilderberger meeting in Salzjobaden, Sweden, in the spring of 1973 and saying, well, we're going to have a 400% increase in the price of oil. This is designed to try to shore up the dollar by creating artificial demand for the dollar. Otherwise, the dollar might have ceased to be this international currency that it's been able to remain over the past 30 years. But all of this stuff causes tremendous frictions. There's also the fact that Nixon is widely hated. Uh, he's a paranoid personality. He's abrasive. He tends to isolate himself, right? The word about the Nixon White House was you have the Chinese wall of Haldeman and Ehrlichman. You have the imperial presidency. You have the White House palace guard. People can't get through to talk to Nixon. He's a recluse. He's secretive. This generates tremendous resentment and suspicion in the minds of the oligarchy. So there's also a lot of hatred against Nixon left over from the uh, McCarthyite period, the Helen Gehagen Douglas and all the other things that Nixon had championed, all of his red baiting and uh, totalitarianism that he was pushing under under the uh, the aegis of Senator Joe McCarthy and the and the witch hunt against communists here, there, and everywhere, Alger Hiss uh, and so forth. Right? Some of these names don't mean a lot to people today, but these were immensely charged issues at the time. So Nixon was widely hated. I'm speaking with author and historian Webster Tarpley. Today's show, The Ford Presidency. I'm Bonnie Faulkner. This is Guns and Butter. Finally, I would say most fundamental is that the finance oligarchs have just had two presidents. They've had Kennedy, who tried very hard to reassert the powers of the presidency as they had been exercised by Franklin D. Roosevelt. Generally speaking, the only president after Lincoln who really exercises the power of the presidency, who you can really say is president of the United States, is Roosevelt, but uh, Franklin. But then Kennedy attempts to, to return to these methods. And, of course, the oligarchy at that point says, well, we'll never allow another real president of the United States. We are an oligarchy. We are the rule of the few, the bankers, and we do not accept the idea that there can be a constitutional president who's more powerful than we are. And that's what Roosevelt was, and this is what they're permanently organized to stop. Even today, a lot of what they do is dictated by precisely these considerations. Right? Why they prefer such weak puppet presidents, as, say, as the, as the current one, people who can't think. Uh, and so on down the line. Can't resist what the bankers might want. However, they'd seen Kennedy try to assert the presidency, therefore he had to be liquidated. And Johnson. Uh, Johnson was, on the whole, more powerful than they wanted also, although he was mentally much weaker than than Kennedy. You can read about Johnson in uh, Doris Kern's book, LBJ and the American Dream. He had a whole series of complexes that they were able to play on, right? His feelings of social inferiority and intellectual inferiority, and Doris Kearns writes all about this stuff. But nevertheless, the fact that Johnson 
had been so powerful as the majority leader of the Senate, in a Democratic Senate, and then moving on to become the, the, um, the president, this gave him a certain amount of control over the legislative and executive branches that was too much. So Johnson had to be ushered out. Uh, and then you get this period of Nixon, and Nixon, with his paranoia, seems to he seems to excite fears that there's going to be another imperial presidency, probably more appearance than reality behind that. But at this point, the oligarchy basically says, let us take this moment where there's so much discontent about the Vietnam War, about the Bretton Woods system collapsing, about the energy crisis, uh, about the social breakdown, a whole series of other things, right? The, the counterculture had created a tremendous backlash, right? The prevalence of narcotics and all the rest of this. They say, let us make Nixon into a terrible example. Let us destroy him and let us use that to permanently weaken not just the presidency, because they wanted to weaken the presidency, but let's weaken the Congress, too. Let's, let's uh, subject the congressional committee system to a watergating process, which we can then use to assert more and more financier control over the government. Because I think you can see this, this aspect in Watergate as it plays out over a, a, just a few more years, perhaps, than, than the mid-'70s. So this is what they do. And the idea with it is it's something like this. It starts with leaks. We just had some leaks, right? You saw the leak of the Maliki Memorandum, the leak of, uh, of uh, Rumsfeld's Farewell Snowflake. Whenever you have leaks, you have to wonder what's going on. Is, is the overthrow of the president going to be prepared? In the case of, of Nixon, the leak is the leak of the Pentagon Papers in the summer of 1971, I guess it is, uh, which is essentially a bunch of secrets that are not secrets. Anybody who had been reading Le Monde or any competent European paper knew all this stuff. There was nothing in the Pentagon Papers that was really new. But it was an occasion when the Pentagon Papers were leaked and the New York Times published them and the Boston Globe and the Washington Post and the whole establishment came out to support the leaking of these papers by Daniel Ellsberg, a nuclear targeting planner of the Rand Corporation, not a uh, not an innocent babe, I'm sure, uh, but rather somebody playing an assigned part. At this point, uh, Kissinger is able to go to Nixon and play on his paranoia, saying to him something like, Mr. President, these leaks are killing us. We can't have a competent government if we've got the leaks of all of these important documents. And there was not just the Pentagon Papers, but also a crisis between India and Pakistan in those same years, the so-called tilt crisis, where Nixon wanted to support Pakistan as part of the China card, but uh, much of the State Department was actually supporting India. And there were leaks in there. There was stuff with Jack Anderson and so forth, right? Source Eggnog, now known as Brit Hume of Fox News, comes out of all this. So, what happens is Kissinger goes to Nixon. He says, look, there are all these leaks. We've got to do something about it. We've got to create a special secret police in the White House to fight the leaks. These are the plumbers. Who gets to be a member of the plumbers? Well, the most notorious CIA covert operative of the Cold War, Howard Hunt, the guy who you know overthrew the government of Guatemala and committed God knows what other crimes, attempts to kill Castro, possible role in the Kennedy assassination, and so forth and, and so on. And Gordon Liddy, uh, a member of the, uh, the FBI, who's got Nazi sympathies, he's got you know, all kinds of you know, Germanic race theories going through his head and so forth, and, and, a, and a group of others. So that's the group that is created. And, of course, they go and run wild. They go and break into the Watergate building, the offices of the Democratic National Committee, not once, not twice, but three times, four times, until they get caught. Because the goal is to get caught and then implicate Nixon in a cover-up. Uh, and that's pretty much how it goes. From then on, you get people revealing in the course of hearings that there's a secret White House taping system, the Butterfield revelations. You've got John Dean, another person playing an assigned role, I think, again, not a fighter for democracy and the purity of the Constitution, but somebody who's working for the powers that be. And the powers that be, of course, are not Nixon, but uh, Wall Street, London, people like this. Um, Ellsberg, uh, Dean, all playing their roles. Uh, and, of course, Nixon playing his role, too, and manipulated in this paranoia. And the interesting one is 
the smoking gun tape, the tape which, when revealed in August of 1974, forces Nixon to resign almost immediately. The idea there is that he says there's a group of Texans that have been that have been funneling money illegally to the committee to reelect the president. And he says, well, those Texans will have to testify so and so and so and this, that, and the other thing, and we'll we'll tell the uh, FBI that it's a CIA operation and we'll shut them down this way. The interesting thing here is that the group of Texans that he's referring to includes George H. W. Bush, Bush the Elder, Bush the forty first uh, president of the United States. So that is what brings down Nixon. So the idea is it's a it's a complicated process of coup d'etat that takes a couple of years. Uh, if Nixon had been smarter, he could have fought back. Now the relevance of all this to Gerald Ford is simply this. When they talk about the pardon that Ford gave Nixon, right, but people remember, you know, the television is, is reminding us, oh, Ford was a great guy. He wanted to heal the country. Let's put an end to all of this divisive contention, and let's not drag poor Nixon with phlebitis in front of the, of the uh, magistrates and, you know, have him in the prisoner's dock. You know, he has suffered enough, and then poor Pat and all the rest of this. This is, of course, a lot of malarkey. The issue is, that if Nixon had been put with his back to the wall and had to mount a legal defense, the legal defense would most likely have included the fact that there had been a conspiracy to have a coup d'etat against the elected president of the United States, because that is what had happened, quite independent of you know, the obvious uh, you know, animus that everybody has against Nixon as a villain and, and all the rest of it, which I share. But you've got to have the clarity of seeing that the main issue is that Nixon is being overthrown by this group. If you look in a book called uh, Body of Secrets by Jim Haugen, you'll see that he... Uh, he points out there's a guy in New York City called Wollstone Smith, who's a New Zealander, um, pretty much a British agent, who gives briefings in advance in June of 1972. In the first days of June 1972, he basically goes through a scenario for people saying, hey, there's going to be a bunch of break-ins into the Watergate buildings, and this is going to lead to a crisis that's going to overthrow Nixon. So this is this is what Ford is essentially doing. He's playing his part in that. So he's told, Ford is told by Nelson Rockefeller, the personification of this CIA Rockefeller Mellon Morgan faction that runs much of the country, not all, but a lot, uh, give him a pardon, give him a pardon. And, of course, he says, yes, sir, and he writes out the pardon, even though with this he's essentially destroying his own political future. How was Gerald Ford... Uh, chosen to succeed Spiro Agnew as Nixon's vice president. It, it's a conference of various people in the Congress because under the relevant amendment of the Constitution, he had to be approved by the Congress. And the idea was that he was well known to the House, well known to the Senate, and he was acceptable to all of them. He was sort of the one, there were no black ball, there were no vetoes against him. So he, at this level, he was acceptable to the legislative leaders, and of course he was, he was acceptable to the invisible government because he had proven that he was a pliable puppet in the course of the, uh, of the Kennedy uh, cover-up, right, to the, um, the Warren Commission. I'm speaking with author and historian Webster Tarpley. Today's show, The Ford Presidency. I'm Bonnie Faulkner. This is Guns and Butter. Now, now we get to another interesting one. When Ford becomes president, right, Nixon departs, right, Nixon leaves. It's August of 1974. The vice presidency becomes vacant. Now, I urge you to, uh, a, a lot of what I'm talking about comes, let me just make a parenthesis. I spent uh, 10 days in 1991 at the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Very interesting place. Full of stuff about George Bush, the elder, which was what I was looking for there. Right? I was researching my book, George Bush, The Unauthorized Biography, and uh, I have a chapter in this called Bush Attempts the Vice Presidency. What happened was when Ford moved up, Nixon departed, Ford moved up, the vice presidency was vacant. There was then a second round of picking a new vice president, because Agnew had been forced out, Ford had been put in. Ford moves up, got to get a new vice president. So at this point, there's a contest. 
Originally, it's three ways. First of all, it's Nelson Rockefeller for the financiers and the liberal Republicans. Barry Goldwater is the favorite son of the reactionary Republicans and the overt warmongers and the, the wild men, so to speak. And George Bush the Elder is the third candidate. And very early on, Goldwater drops out in favor of Bush the Elder, and it gets to be a fight between Nelson Rockefeller and George Bush uh, to see who's going to be the vice president. So from the point of view of the banking community, this is great because you've essentially got Chase Manhattan Bank with Rockefeller and Standard Oil competing against Brown Brothers Harriman in the person of Bush the Elder. So um, it's also interesting to see, if you look in that little chapter, you can see who are the people who wanted um, Bush to get the, the, get the vice presidency. Very, very interesting uh, array. Anyway, finally, Ford chooses Nelson Rockefeller who had been you know, governor of New York, presidential candidate, famous leader of, of the financier Republicans, right? Liberal Republican means financier. Liberal means financier, pretty much, in my book. So here's the problem that this poses for Ford. <laughs> he, he, in, in 1974, he lets Nelson in. In 1975, in a period of one month, there are two attempts to assassinate poor Jerry Ford showing how expendable he is. We get uh, Sarah Jane Moore and Lynette Squeaky Fromm. And I believe one or more of these takes place in California, in San Francisco. And the, the news reports are full of the fact, you know, the bullet holes are still, in front of, still visible in the front of the hotel um, where this all happened. The problem with this is, though, you have two attempts to assassinate the President of the United States in one month. Now, the usual theory, of course, is, oh, it's just another one of those lone assassins. <laughs> but what happens when you have two lone assassins? <laughs> Isn't that somehow a contradiction in terms? I mean, if you had three lone assassins, would they still be lone assassins? Looks to me like once you get two, it's not lone assassins anymore. It's a product, it's, it's a, a pattern which points to a conspiracy. Maybe this is just a, an occupational hazard that I have. So um, he is, gets these pot shots taken at him. And it probably has something to do with the fact that he's preparing to reshuffle his administration and also fairly soon to tell Nelson Rockefeller that he doesn't want Nelson on the ticket for 1976. He's going to get rid of Nelson Rockefeller, and he's going to bring in Bob Dole, who's much more acceptable to the right-wing Republicans that are now more and more dominating the party, right? The liberal financier Republicans, of course, being in, in a period of, of decline, and Nelson Rockefeller widely hated, and deservedly so, because of, of what he represented. Uh, the Halloween massacre by Ford, so-called, was Halloween, October 31st, 1975, he deprived Kissinger of his two hats, right? Kissinger had been Secretary of State and the head of the National Security Council. On that Halloween, Gerald Ford said, no, no, Henry, you're going to have to be content with Secretary of State. I'm bringing in Brent Scowcroft, <laughs> later Kissinger's business partner, to be the uh, NSC director. He ousts James Rodney Schlesinger, Rodney the Robot, a kind of um, Dr. Strangelove of, of nuclear warfare game theory, is ousted from the Pentagon. Donald Rumsfeld becomes the Secretary of Defense. All this time, Dick Cheney is the um, Chief of Staff for Ford in the White House. Uh, we also get Colby ousted from the CIA, and George Bush the Elder is brought back from China to be the head of the CIA. Interesting. The reason that, that Bush the Elder couldn't get the Vice Presidency in 1974 was that he was so dirty as a result of his involvement up to his neck in one of Nixon's uh, illegal political slush funds, illegal money funds, the townhouse fund. Uh, so what they had to do for, for Bush the Elder was to find him a job that did not require Senate uh, confirmation, and it was the representative in Beijing. So George Bush the Elder essentially became Henry Kissinger's secretary, steward, running dog, if you will, in Beijing for the year 1975, and then they bring him back to be the head of the CIA, and at that point things have calmed down a little bit. If you read in my book about those hearings, Gary Hart and some others do ask him, you know, how about these, uh, you know, how about the money laundering? They essentially show that they know that Bush is in the, um, the smoking gun tape and that there's been, you know, slush funds going on, but they say, well, what the heck, we'll let him in, as long as Ford promises that he won't make Bush 
the vice presidential candidate because it would be improper, they say, to have the CIA director be involved in partisan politics. It might lead to a contradiction, uh, a conflict of interest. Having mentioned all these names, you see what Ford does. Ford essentially sponsors the careers of so many of the principal operatives of this invisible government down to our own time. Look at the names we've just mentioned. Cheney is the White House Chief of Staff. Rumsfeld is the Secretary of Defense. Um, Alan Greenspan, who has run the economic side of U.S. life for 15 years or so until you know, just a few months ago, is uh, at the Council of Economic Advisors. George Bush is in there. Bremer, who, who destroyed Iraq, is, is on Kissinger's staff. And you can make a very long list. The main heavies of the invisible government that we're plagued with until the present time get their big moment, their big chance to you know, make the big career leap under Gerald R. Ford. Or yes, I noticed when I saw the pictures in the newspaper of uh, Gerald Ford's memorial service and the people attending, it was all the same people that were in his administration that are in the administration now. It's essentially a permanent uh, bureaucracy. It's a revolving door, right? Every time a Republican gets reelected, these same discredited, failed bureaucrats come back. But let's see how Ford was essentially gotten rid of. Now we're in 1976. Times have changed. The demands of the finance oligarchs are even greater than they were in 1974 and 1975 because it's a tremendous world crisis going on in the background. Remember, the, the dollar is in danger of losing its status as the principal currency. The Vietnam War has been lost. Right, We've had the fall of Saigon to the North Vietnamese right in the middle of Ford. Uh, we've got all of this you know, huge upheaval going on. At this point, the, the banking community says, why don't we get rid of Ford? Let's bring in somebody else who's even more pliable and more adventurous, right? Somebody who's got more, uh, like we say, brinksmanship. Somebody who's going to take greater risks. So they find this obscure governor, Jimmy Carter, who has already had at least one nervous breakdown. This is what Carter describes as his born-again experience. But in, in one of his earlier runs for governor of Georgia, he had lost the election, had a nervous breakdown after that, called that his born-again experience, and was therefore than acceptable to the uh, establishment. Right? They like to have people who've got a, a certain history of psychological problems. For example, for Gerald R. Ford, it's that he's, he's an orphan. right? He, he's separated from his original parents at a very early age. And to the banking community, that is a sign that somebody's sense of identity may be weaker. In the case of Carter, it's that, that he's had this nervous breakdown. So we have in the spring of uh, 1976, I guess it is, or late 75, a meeting of the Trilateral Commission in Kyoto, Japan, where uh, Jimmy Carter, governor of Georgia, little known, is introduced by Gianni Agnelli of Fiat, the Italian automobile company, to this group of international bankers and globalists, saying, ladies and gentlemen, here's the next president of the United States. It's going to be Jimmy Carter. Why do they want him? Because Carter is willing to do two things. He's willing to turn the government of the United States over to two individuals. One is Volcker, who is going to take over the Federal Reserve. He's going to raise interest rates to 22%, the highest since Jesus Christ, as Helmut Schmidt of Germany pointed out. And uh, he's also going to turn foreign policy over to Zbigniew Brzezinski, who is a dangerous adventurer against the Soviets. Uh, and he remains that to this day. He's a Polish petty nobleman with British intelligence background through Canada, who's got this tremendous animus against the Soviets. And they, they feel that they want to do something uh, ambitious uh, in order to redress the fact that the U.S. is, is uh, you know, so obviously defeated in Saigon in 1975. They're thinking about, you know, going on to a confrontation track against the Soviets and having a confrontation cabinet chosen by, by Carter. And, and Brzezinski would be the key guy at the National Security Council. So we get to the 1976 election. And I lived through this. Uh, the interesting thing about the 1976 election is Ford won the election. <laughs> Ford won. Carter was defeated. Uh, the reason that Ford was, was not able to have a second term was that Carter, had, the, the machine supporting Carter, carried out massive vote fraud in New York City, uh, New York State in general, and in Ohio. 
if you go back, uh, a, a Republican Party official, Fioravante Perotta in Manhattan, on the night of the election, went to court to get the voting machines seized as, as a prelude to trying to figure out you know, how this vote fraud had, had come about. And in Ohio, the same thing. On the morning of Election Day, Walter Mondale, the candidate for vice president with, with Carter, said, vote early, vote often. <laughs> And that's exactly what they did. They bust people back and forth between Ohio, uh, Kentucky, Indiana. There's some people voted in all three states and so forth. And it, it was simply, uh, you know, it was a massive vote fraud. It was so massive that it became obvious to Ford in the White House that he had been the victim of vote fraud. Now the question is, what's he going to do? At this point, we have to remember that he has this the pathetic figure of Betty Ford who by this time is a, uh, well, she's an alcoholic, she's a substance abuser, right? She's later going to go on to this, you know, meritorious humanitarian project of founding the Betty Ford Clinic to try to help people who have these problems, which are common in society. But the problem is when you get to the apex of power and you've got these weaknesses, you can then be played on. It becomes a, a vulnerability. The vulnerability was exploited by a person we haven't mentioned yet. We've mentioned that Nelson Rockefeller is the vice president in the White House with Ford, representing CIA, Rockefeller, Chase Manhattan Bank, the oil cartel, you name it. But Rockefeller's second wife now, uh, Happy Rockefeller, is the operative. Happy Rockefeller goes to Betty Ford and reasons with her that the presidency is not worth it, that she really doesn't enjoy the life in the White House. There's too much stress, too much pressure. It's obviously causing a terrible toll on her. And essentially, Happy convinces Betty that if Jerry fights the vote fraud, he'll be throwing his legacy away. The reasoning is, Jerry's legacy is that he healed the country after Watergate and brought us back to calm political life. But if you go out and fight vote fraud, if you accuse Carter Mondale of, of masterminding vote fraud, then you reopen all the terrible wounds. So it's better to capitulate. It's better to go gracefully into the night and not fight the vote fraud, even though it could have been done. And it was some of this stuff was actually proven in court by by people who who uh, you know were concerned about the integrity of the election. But since Ford was not fighting, uh, there was nothing that that could be done. So. This has been what happened, because Ford is smart enough to realize that if Happy Rockefeller is telling Betty this, this is Nelson, and therefore this is the banking community that has more uh, Lynette Squeaky Farms and more Sarah Jane Moores in the background, so he better do it. And that's how we get the disastrous Carter administration. I, 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 want, I hasten to point out, I think Carter in the last couple of years, especially in the last six months or so, has has done many, many good and useful things. But I, we have to hold on also to the fact that the Carter presidency was a disaster and that he was pre-programmed with these people like Volcker and, and Brzezinski and the Trilateral Commission expressing you know, a new wave of policy coming out of the banking community. So that's the end of the Ford presidency. I'm speaking with author and historian Webster Tarpley. Today's show the Ford presidency. I'm Bonnie Faulkner. This is Guns and Butter. Now there's one last thing that I think is worth discussing, and this would be the co-presidency. That is the flurry of interest in the summer of 1980 that Gerald Ford might now run for vice president as the number two man on a ticket led by Ronald Reagan. Right? Ford had been sparring with Reagan. Right? Ford is obviously a liberal financier Republican. Reagan is somebody who is slightly different in his cultural background, really not important, but you know they're fighting also about careers, right? the personal rivalry, ambition, and all the rest of it. By the time we get to 1980, we have a situation where the establishment, the bankers, are willing to accept Reagan as president, but they want a financier agent as vice president, and that's going to be George H.W. Bush, Bush the Elder, father of the current tenant of the White House. The problem now is that Reagan hates Bush. Reagan is deeply convinced that Bush is not qualified to be president, that he's mentally unstable, immature, uh, politically stupid, 
uh, and so forth. How did he get this? Right, because Reagan, of course, is not an eagle. Reagan, Reagan is a is a, somebody also of limited mental equipment in the same way that that Ford has been. The scene, however, is that Reagan sees it all acted out in front of him. In New Hampshire, you can look in my book again, George Bush, The Unauthorized Biography, the campaign 1980 chapter. We're talking now about the Nashua Telegraph debate <laughs> of uh, February 1980. Now, people may remember this. This is the one where Reagan's, the, uh, the moderator says, turn off Governor Reagan's microphone. And Reagan says, I'm paying for this microphone, Mr. Green. Right? People remember these, these exchanges. The, the basis of this was somehow Bush the Elder was trying to position himself as the main alternative to Ronald Reagan, who was the leading candidate. Uh, there were other Republicans in the field, but by inveigling and by you know, various kinds of intrigue, Bush the Elder was able to get a debate set up, sponsored by this local newspaper, the Nashua, New Hampshire Telegraph, where it would be Bush the Elder against Ronald Reagan and everybody else excluded. At the night that this uh, debate is going to take place, however, the other candidates appear. The other candidates being U.S. Senator Robert Dole, who had run for vice president, uh, Congressman John Anderson, Congressman Phil Crane, a, a, a conservative uh, worthy from Illinois, um, Howard Baker, Senator Howard Baker, right, who had been an important uh, Republican senator right, back in Watergate. So they say, look, it's unfair to have a debate with only two. All of us should participate. At that point, Ronald Reagan, with his sunny, avuncular disposition, says, sure, let them all speak. And this is what the crowd wants. They say, get chairs for all these fine Republicans, and let's have a real good Republican debate. George Bush is up on the stage, and he says, no, 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 never, never, never. It's my debate. You know, It's my party, and I'll exclude whoever I want. So uh, and this goes on, right? and this this is one of the reasons that Bush loses the primaries because he he basically has a little Lord Fauntleroy fit in front of the cameras and in front of this public, uh, and through this Reagan says, "My God, this person is he doesn't have the elementary political gifts." Any smart Paul would say, "Sure, you know, I have to bow to the inevitable and make my image you know intact as much as I can." But not Bush the Elder, right? He has this a hyperthyroid, thyroid storm moment in this debate. So Reagan is convinced that he doesn't want Bush. So here's what they do. An intrigue is mounted. Jerry Ford is the bait. Henry Kissinger is brought in as a negotiator. And through various means, they plant the idea in Reagan's head that Gerald R. Ford might well be willing to come on the ticket as the vice presidential candidate. But, of course, he's got, you know, uh, conditions, right? He wants to get certain things for himself. He wants to control foreign policy. He wants to have Henry Kissinger as Secretary of State again. He wants to have Alan Greenspan as Secretary of the Treasury, you know, bringing on this whole crew of discredited, invisible government characters from his own administration. Basically wants to pack the Reagan administration, which is a different sociological group, with these same, you know, liberal New York uh, banking types. So Reagan is drawn into this negotiation. Now, essentially, the whole thing was never in good faith. It was never serious. But what it was was to play on the fact that, Re that Reagan is dumb and then keep going with these back and forth. Kissinger is shuttling back and forth his greatest shuttle diplomacy. They bring new conditions to Reagan. They get, take Reagan's uh, responses back to Ford, back to Reagan, back to Ford. Back to, and all of a sudden, it's the night at the convention where where Reagan has got to name a vice presidential candidate. And at this point, Ford drops out. He says, well, I don't think we'll be able to do this. I guess I better take myself out of contention. At this point, Reagan has about two or three hours left, and he's got to name a vice president. It's time. And if he doesn't do it, he looks like a fool. Right? He looks like somebody who can't face you know, the first big choice of running for president. Who's the, who's the vice president? So at that point, he picks up the phone and he calls Bush. He says, uh, George, would you like to come on the ticket? I'd be honored, Governor. And that's it. But he does it holding his nose and he does it uh, with a real revulsion against Bush because he's convinced that Bush is not qualified to be to be president. Now, the proof of all this also, it's in my book, George Bush, The Unauthorized Biography. As Ford is leaving the Republican convention, 
he's asked by a journalist who meets him at the airport, hey, President Ford, hey, Jerry, what did you think of the convention? And Ford says, I'm very happy with the convention. I came here with one main thing that I wanted to do. I wanted to make sure that George Bush was the vice presidential candidate. I succeeded. It's Bush for vice president, and uh, that's going to be wonderful. This, of course, was not what the delegates wanted. If you've ever heard the moment when Reagan, breaking with tradition, goes to the convention and says, I'm not going to nominate Ford, I'm going to nominate Bush. There's a boo and a groan at the name of Bush. Because Bush, of course, is a financier, liberal, Republican, that these right-wing characters and the, you know, the dominant people in the Republican Party by then don't want. So that is essentially the story with, uh, with Ford. Now, Webster, you have spoken about powerful forces that want to weaken the presidency and that that had a lot to do with Nixon being watergated. But do you think it would be more correct to say that they wanted a weakened president as the individual rather than a weakened office of the presidency? Well, I think you can find, if you compare it, say, to the... Um some of these things get into comparisons that are complex, but if you look at Andrew Johnson's impeachment but then non-conviction, you would have to say that the president's coming after Johnson, uh, people like Grant and uh, Arthur and people like this, represent it's a very weak phase of the presidency. In other words, an attempted impeachment tends to set up a presidency which is permanently weakened. And I would say the same thing concerning Clinton, that the Clinton impeachment certainly weakened Clinton. It made it possible, for example, for Al Gore to begin the bombing of Serbia in the spring of 1999, really without much reference to Clinton. It was really a decision by uh, an oligarchy, right? That is to say, by the so-called Principles Committee. You can read about this in my book, 9-11 Synthetic Terror, Made in USA. When it came to bombing Serbia, Clinton was very ambivalent. Gore wanted it. This was the British geopolitical line was, let's, let's bomb Serbia. But the group that put it through was not just Gore. It was Madeleine Albright. It was uh, Secretary of Defense William Cohen, General Hugh Shelton, Richard Clark, the, uh, the darling of the 9-11 uh, Commission and a few others, but there was essentially this thing called the Principles Committee that took power. So for the 1999-2000, power in the United States was not in the hands of Clinton. He had mortgaged his presidency uh, very much to allow this to happen, to stay in office, and it was essentially the Principles Committee that, that ran the country. And I would say even today, the presidency is permanently weakened. <laughs> Look at Bush. This is not a strong president. For example, if the oil cartel decides that gasoline is going to cost three fifty a gallon, they can do it because they're more powerful than the United States with a weak president like Bush. Again, I, as I try to write in my um, Bush bio, the model of a Bush presidency is a weak, passive executive who has no program except to take power and, and give jobs and money to cronies, a weak, passive president who sits in the Oval Office and waits for his handlers to come and tell him what it is that he must do. And you see that, for example, in Bush on the day of 9-11. He has no idea what to do. He has no idea of decisive executive action, even in, even in, the, in the terms that he might have understood it uh, in the school there in, in Florida. He, he just sits there, right, as people have pointed out. He, he doesn't uh, respond in any way. He's catatonic. He's frozen. Obviously, there's much more going on behind it. But just in terms of what a president might have done, uh, he doesn't do it. So I would say the goal is, again, to weaken the presidency as an institution by showing that presidents can be destroyed. The presidents can't fight back. In other words, if the New York banking community and the Boston Globe and the Washington Post and the New York Times decide that somebody is going to be destroyed, well, they're destroyed. And the CIA and the FBI and Henry Kissinger will pile on him. Kissinger, of course, being a, a creature of Rockefeller made great by Nelson Rockefeller in the 1950s, but then Kissinger also branching out to loyalties to people like Lord Cromer in London, or the Royal Institute for International Affairs, Chatham House, extremely important uh, in, in Kissinger's career. Uh, the idea that it's an oligarchy. In other words, the, the goal of the oligarchy 
is always to maintain oligarchy and to prevent anybody from actually exercising the, the constitutional powers of the presidency because these would tend to negate the power of, of oligarchy. Again, look at Roosevelt or even look at Kennedy. Uh, at a certain point, Roger Blau of the United States Steel and a group of, of financiers and, and, uh, and, and people running these corporations decide that they're going to raise the price of steel and they're going to renege on a, on a deal they've made with Kennedy. And Kennedy is, is able simply to mobilize the power of the federal government to crush Roger Blau, to make him back down. And this is one of the reasons that Kennedy has to be liquidated. So, Webster, would you then say that the oligarchy wants a weak government generally, all three branches is weak, because Congress is weak as well? Yes, I, I think that's essentially it. In other words, the demagogy that you can you can associate with Milton Friedman, let's say. Uh, here's another departed person, but we've got to uh, point out the monstrous evil of, of Milton Friedman. His demagogy is that big government per se is bad. Well, this is simply ridiculous. The question is, big government for whom? Uh, you've got to have a strong state. I would say you've got to have a state, a government, which is strong enough to defeat the likes of ExxonMobil and Halliburton and J.P. Morgan Chase. It's got to be a government that's capable of fighting back against these tremendous uh, monopolies, oligopolies, cartels that, that are the essence of economic globalization. And if you have a weak government, uh, you simply cannot, uh, you can't do these things. And, of course, the, the Congress has also been, uh, you know, beaten over the head. 9-11 uh, is really the key to all of this in our own time. It, it's essentially that there's a, a network inside the institutions of the United States. Again, I, I call it the invisible government. In this case, we're talking about the, the action arm of the invisible government. We're talking about... Uh, in the 1963 case with Kennedy, it's the CIA Operations Directorate and its allies. Now, a lot of that has been privatized, so you're talking essentially about a rogue network that exists inside the Department of Defense, the CIA, the Special Forces Command, the National Security Council, NSA, DIA, the Treasury, you name it. It's all through there. But it's also got a large privatized component in the private military firms, the various defense contractors. A lot of this privatization was done under under Reagan's executive order 12333 in the, in the early 1980s. The, the Cold War CIA was essentially privatized into front companies even more than it had been. So uh, this group decides that they're going to change the foreign policy of the United States. They're going to attempt to reorganize the world around the war on terror by staging 9-11 using their patsies, their al-Qaeda, Atta, bin Laden, the rest of these people as, as boogeymen, uh, running the stuff through military drills of the Pentagon and these private military firms, and then bring, bringing about this stuff. And at that point, the Congress has basically ceased to exist. But it's also the presidency. Bush is president today because he eagerly rushed to capitulate to this unconstitutional coup d'etat that was 9-11. In other words, he's there as the spokesman for the coup group. He's not president of the United States in any meaningful sense. He's simply the, the, the person who was allowed to stay on. Right? He was an expendable puppet on 9-11. He knew it, uh, and he did everything he could to show that he was going to go along with what was, uh, what was happening in, in the same way that Gerald Ford could see that there was a coup d'etat against Nixon and decided to become part of it and to, to become a beneficiary of it. Webster Tarpley, thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure always, and Happy New Year, Happy uh, 2007. I think it'll be a year of convulsions and cataclysms, but I hope it's a happy one anyway.